Well, thank you so much, Anna, for your introduction. And thanks, thank you to the organization for having invited me. This is a very interesting conference and, and it's been so, so far. I will try to share my screen. And hopefully we have no problem. Okay, um, can you see my presentation? Okay, so as I said, thank you for the invitation. And in um, the context of this roundtable regarding the management, dietary management of DAO deficiency, I wanted to tell you about how, why, and where we find histamine and other biogenic histamines in foods, and why uh, it is difficult to follow uh, low histamine diets. As uh, we said in previous uh, presentations of my colleagues, uh, and currently the treatment of this uh, histamine intolerance is done through the, uh, the use of low histamine foods or diets or with the intake of a DAO enzyme supplements. In these two approaches, uh, there are more studies published uh, with uh, these low histamine uh, foods. If the symptoms of this histamine intolerance is dietary histamine, it seems to be logical to think that the only thing you might need to eliminate is those um, foods that have a histamine, for example, uh, in the same way as you do it with a lactose intolerant patients. But carrying out um, or having these uh, low histamine diets or uh, avoiding the consumption of histamine-rich uh, foods is not as easy as we could think. The first difficulty we encounter would be, what does it mean to say low histamine foods? Well, there is no um, agreed level of histamine from which uh, some kind of food would be low histamine. And there are authors that say that uh, foods with levels under 20 milligrams kilo would be considered low histamine foods, while other authors are more... Um, um, the, they, they take this threshold under one or two milligrams per kilo. But the reality is that we do not have uh, yet this value that would give a clear definition of what low in histamine is. Another problem that we encounter nowadays is that we cannot indicate the presence of histamine in, in, in the label of the different kinds of foods. That would make it very much easier to do it, to comply with this low histamine diet. But um, to start with, in which foods can we find histamine? Well, in this image, we show the average contents of a histamine in the different foods in the market, in the Spanish market, and its uh, maximum levels and minimum levels. And these um, contents come from the database of the research group, and it includes more than 100 types of uh, foods with a total of more than 180, sorry, 1,800 samples. I would like to say that part of these data have been used and published by EPSA, the European Agency of Food Safety, in the assessment that it carried out uh, regarding the risk associated with the uh, intake of biogenic histamines in food in different member states. Well, in this um, graphic, this chart, we can see the different average le levels and the great variability that we can find uh, in vegetable origin uh, foods on the right and animal origin foods uh, on the left. Where uh, to start with, we would feel that it's more frequent to, to find this kind of um, amines. And contents are very variable from the different kinds of food here or even within the same kind of uh, food uh, group. Here we have some uh, very um, high deviations. And even if you cannot see it on this chart, in, uh, in the batches of the same type of uh, food. For example, the case of fish. Um, here, the average level of histamine wouldn't be too high. In fact, it is a little, it's quite low because when the fish is fresh and it's uh, maintained in the adequate uh, conditions, then histamine wouldn't be formed or in very low, uh, as a very low content. So the majority of samples from the market uh, wouldn't, didn't show this uh, histamine, so the average is quite low. But uh, nevertheless, in some occasions, uh, we would have a very high histamine levels, like we can see here in the case of uh, fresh fish with values of 221 milligrams kilo, 
per kilo or uh, tinned uh, fish and in other uh, tin fish uh, products with values of 660. Not only, that doesn't only happen with fish, it happens with other characteristic foods that are susceptible of uh, containing histamine, for example, meat derivatives, 445 uh, milligrams. Well, it's from the non-detected to the or under the detection limit. And in this case, that would be less than 0.05 up to 475 in, in some fermented uh, meat uh, products also cheese and wines. In wines, we find more in, in, in red wine and in vegetables. And that's quite peculiar, you know, because you think about vegetables not having high uh, content of histamine, but yes, it happens in those uh, fermented, 730 maximum, corresponding to a soy uh, deriv derivatives, fermented soy. This high variability of the contents uh, makes it very difficult to uh, comply with this low histamine diet because uh, uh, we would think that uh, we, we can uh, preserve the intake of these kind of uh, foods, but we've seen how the levels uh, can vary and we can have very high levels at some point. So out of uh, precaution, we eliminate it from these kind of diets. There's a wide distribution and variability. It's not only a characteristic of histamine, as we can see in, these, um, in this chart, we can see it's a part of the other bioactive amines in foods, for example, tyramine, putrescine, cadaverine, and other uh, polyamines like esper espermine and espermidine. And except to the polyaminas, because they have a more physiological origin, as we said in the morning, Briefly, in some case of the in some of the samples, these uh, amines were absent or had very low levels. The percentages of uh, samples with uh, amines were uh, varied a lot depending on the food, but it was about thirty percent of the samples uh, depending on the food. Of course, uh, they they could be under this detection limit, but in other occasions, there are um, many foods that have a high uh, content, these other amines. We're not talking about histamine here. For example, we're talking about the uh, dry fermented um, meat derivatives or sausages, also cheese uh, with very high deviations. Um, we have samples in which they have gone over 100, uh, sorry, 1000 milligrams kilo of tyramine or putrescine. Putres to understand uh, this uh, variability, um, although it was mentioned this morning already by Dr. Vidal, I would like to very briefly remind you of which is the main origin. And, uh, well, we talked about it throughout the whole of the conference, the origin of histamine or any other histamine, any other amine that we mentioned in, in the foods. It's because of the decarbolization of uh, precursor amino acids that are present in the foods by the action of uh, bacterial origin enzyme. So this decarboxylation comes from this uh, amino acid decarboxylase, and it's uh, got a bacterial origin. We would have uh, stidine and using the cofactor, which would be vitamin B6 or pyridoxal 5-phosphate. So, and due to this microbial origin, those uh, foods that have high levels of histamine would be, on the one hand, those microbiologically altered ones in, in which the presence of uh, amines is due to the action of these uh, um, spoiling microbi microbiota, like uh, we could see with, you know, here we see some examples of bacteria, which are uh, altering ones, and they are um, histamine uh, producers, we would say. Uh, very often, these are uh, species, uh, bacteria, morganella, bacteria that appear as the food is um, becoming less fresh. And they have been identified as producers of, uh, of histamine and also putrescine, cadaverine, you know, uh, have a look at the names of these histamines because they refer to processes of uh, alteration or decomposition, bac bacterial decomposition. Uh, 
And uh, on the other hand, as we said before, those uh, fermented products are products that have uh, uh, significant levels of uh, amines. In these um, foods, the bacteria which carry out this uh, fermentative action are responsible for the formation of uh, these uh, compounds. Mainly in this case, that would be lactic acid bacteria like Lactobacillus, Pediococcus, Enterococcus. But also in these kind of products, uh, we do not only have these fermentative bacteria, but other um, alterating or spoiling bacteria, which can be present in raw materials in the uh, elaboration of these fermented products or also incorporated uh, throughout the process of uh, elaboration and production of these uh, fermented products. For example, lactobacillus or other uh, bacteria like E. coli, Enterobacter, Eclipsiella, etc. So, and I open a, a, a little parenthesis here. Uh, uh, we would say that the presence of high quantity of uh, biogenic uh, amines could be an indicator of the hygienic state or uh, uh, a precarious hygienic state of the raw materials and or the elaboration process of certain products, uh, notwithstanding whether there is a presence of microorganisms in the final product or not, because they could disappear uh, with the time or thanks to the technological treatments applied to the food. Um, however, amine, histamines and others do not disappear because they are thermostable compounds. I also wanted to say that there is an important aspect to have into account uh, regarding the capacity of uh, amine formation by bacteria. And this is strain-dependent activity. That means that not all strains of the same species, uh, like the one that I showed you before, will be able to express this um, enzyme activity. So this adds more difficulty uh, when predicting the presence or absence of these amines in foods. So it is always uh, necessary to study case by case, strain by strain, to see whether they um, have this uh, enzyme capacity or not. Apart from the, the, the um, aminogenic capacity of these organisms, there are other reasons or factors that could explain the variability of uh, biogenic amines in, in foods. One would be the time temperature binomia. In these um, charts here, to the left, yes, I, I guess the marker is working. Um, I'm showing you the, uh, the production of amines in different samples of tuna and, and meat, fresh meat, that were refrigerated at, you know, with temperatures, refrigeration temperatures. And in both cases, in the case of tuna and this uh, pork meat, we see that with the passing of, of time, there was an increase of uh, all amines. Uh, for example, in, in tuna, we have uh, the uh, formation here of uh, histamine after two or three days of storage, reaching levels of, uh, of even 900 milligrams per kilo. And in the case of pork, these uh, of meat, these amines started to form after two days. And these uh, amines, well, uh, putristine, tyramine, cadaverine. And in the case of the meat, well, the, the amine that uh, appeared uh, was not um, histamine specially. And we didn't reach the values that, 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 that we reached in with tuna. To the right, we can see the influence of temperature in the production of histamine in a sample of tuna. And here we can see that uh, with the same time, but um, if there is a change in temperature, the amount of histamine could be very different. When tuna uh, was uh, refrigerated at 20, 22 degrees, 24 hours later, we can see how we had very high uh, quantities of histamine over 1,000 milligrams kilo. Well, if uh, this fish uh, was refrigerated at, uh, it, it was the same amount of time, uh, still we didn't have uh, the uh, production of, of histamine. 
It's true that with refriger refrigeration doesn't avoid the production of histamine uh, as we saw before, but of course uh, the, this production is delayed or somehow uh, avoided to some extent if we compare it with the preservation at 22 degrees. And only when the product is being kept at temperatures of zero degrees, that's when there is uh, no production of histamine whatsoever. So time and temperature at which the food is kept are factors that we need to take into account when avoiding the consumption of uh, histamine rich um, foods. The fact that we can find uh, these uh, different contents of amines in the same kind of food depends also on certain kinds of uh, ways of handling uh, the, the, the foods. In this study that I presented, we determined the accumulation of amines in, in the um, hake uh, while it was being kept refrigerated with the only difference that um, one of them would be gutted or non-gutted. So that means, as you can see in the image, that there is no doubt that um, guttering it is a, it's clearly a factor which uh, uh, promotes aminogenesis because, you know, this handling, even though we can be very careful, um, fosters the uh, contamination of the muscle and uh, this transference um, of bacteria from the uh, um, the bowels and, and the guts of the fish to the muscle. So then that would be responsible for the production of uh, amines and the difference that there is between one uh, hake which has been gutted or which hasn't been gutted. So um, that would be another factor to take into account or that would explain these very different contents of uh, amines that we, have, we can find in the same kind of uh, food. In the case of fermented foods, the presence of amines has to do with the raw materials, both from quantitative as qualitative perspectives, the type of amines that can be found. In these two uh, studies that take place here, is for amines in cheese and fermented meat that were assessed uh, on the one hand with uh, raw materials such as food and meat, the uh, raw material of cheese and fermented elements, uh, totally fresh ones, recently bought, and no storage included. And on the other hand, the same product with the same raw material, but being stored for 48 hours. In, in the refrigerator before the use to uh, eat those products. Of course, they were optimal for consumption. In both cases, we saw, as you can see here in the size, the content of amines was uh, quite uh, higher in those products, both cheese and uh, cold cuts that were that were made in 35% of formation of amines here. In the case of cold cuts, it was uh, or dry fermented sausages. It was 70, 70, 771 uh, to 129. And in the profile of amines, it was also the case, in this particular case, when meat was fresh, The elements had to do with the fermentative bacteria. However, in this particular case, there was a higher concentration of cadaverina, potassium, etc. Amines that are related with the action of these bacteria that are altering the food. But in spite of this, the meat was in good hygiene state to be uh, produced. But you can imagine that these variations in the development and the way the raw material was produced, how these can vary that much in the final product. And finally, technological factors, such as the fact that 
the fermentative microbiota, my, microbiota with other technological variables, uh, pH, etc., may vary. As we can see here, there weren't big differences. This is the formation of amines throughout time in the process. It's through the process, not the storage. And here we can see the differences in the accumulation of amines, which is quite relevant. In one case, we used it through uh, a spontaneous fermentation through the microbiota in particular, the one that is present in the meat or in the environment. And it clearly showed an, an important aminogenic capacity. And in this particular lot, the fermentation was started by a culture of the SAK. LSAK is the one. It had the ability of DOA to create amines. So in this particular lot, these were the percentages. And if we compare with the other one, it didn't happen. I would like to comment that today, one of the main strategies to avoid the formation of amines in fermented products is the use of initiating cultures that do not have this discarboxylase activity. In some, both this factor and others that I have commented earlier, give an idea of the type of amines that we can find in the food. And therefore, the difficulty that this entails when establishing the type of uh, food that is high or low in histamine when uh, recommending and following uh, diets that are low in histamine. Coming back to diets that are low in histamine, these diets exclude food that patients associate with the appearance of the symptoms. In this particular case, we have recently published in our research group a comparative review in Nutrients Journal where we have identified and analyzed different histamine, low histamine diets are described. In different studies that have been dealt with in this conference, we have chosen those studies that specified the foods that were excluded. What we have seen is that there is a big difference between the various ones on the foods that can be excluded. All diets unanimously indicate the elimination of fermented Food, almost all of them exclude the consumption of fish and derivatives and certain vegetables such as tomato and spinach. Almost 100% of them excluded those uh, foods. But on the other hand, we see that almost 70% of the foods that are included in the list Of excluded aliment, uh, of excluded uh, foods, it can be eliminated in a low number of diets. It would only be mentioned in four of them. These ones in three, in two, and these ones milk, cherries, soya, all these are only uh, eliminated in one of the diets. So in view of the lack of consensus in the type of diets, in this study, we decided to carry out a critical analysis of diets that were low in histamine, depending on the amount of histamine and other amines in this type of food. Based on the data from our research group, we saw that not all of the foods that are excluded are foods that are typically present in histamine. In fact, a significant number of this list 
do not have histamine. All these um, foods here that are non-marked, normally they don't have histamine. We do include, of course, those that, as you know, may have histamine, and these are the ones here in yellow. We can see the distribution, which is very variable, but there is a likelihood because of the high uh, percentage of histamine pres being present. You have it here in yellow and here in, in images, we're speaking about push and derivatives, some vegetables, spinach, tomato, aubergine, fermented vegetables, some cauliflower, fermented cauliflower, but some legumes as well, soya derivatives that are fermented, etc. In all of them, apart from histamine, we also normally found, find high percentages of other amines. However, these are the uh, foods that are excluded in almost 100% of the diets. So here, in as much as the histamine containing uh, foods, there's no difference because most of the studies agree on these particular ones. When I prepared this in introduction, this uh, presentation, in some uh, places I found references to foods that supposedly have histamine, but they don't. So we have to take that into consideration. There are mistakes of this kind. Be careful with that. As I said earlier, not all the foods that are included in some of these diets include histamine. However, some of these foods that are the ones that I have underlined in blue, in spite of not containing histamine, they do have other amines. Putrescin is one, calabrin is another one. These foods are in this table, they have no histamine. We have gone through many samples and they have never shown to have uh, histamine. They have always been beyond, below the limit. However, they are characterized for the high percentage of putrescine and carnitine and others. Uh, so citric fruits are eliminated in most of the diets. They don't have histamine, but they normally have more than 100 ppm of putrescine. They also have to highlight banana, soya, uh, dried fruit. So there are contradictions of this kind still in the, in the uh, organization of diets. Dr. Vidal this morning said that these amines in themselves won't, won't bring about any adverse effects. But there is a hypothesis that putrescina and cadaverin could be fostering the effects of histamine because they interfere in the degradation of this at an intestine level. They compete for the degradation. Therefore, they bring about more reabsorption in the intestine and there are symptoms involved. However, this situation is uh, being described in reports of all kinds, even by the ETSA, but it is not well uh, contrasted, it's not researched further uh, so far. Today, in a research group, we're studying whether the uh, presence of this type of uh, other amines may have an influence in the degradation by the DAO enzyme. In this figure, we can see the speed to degrade histamine in vitro. This speed is nanomoles per minute when she's on her own or when it is accompanied by putrescine and calabrin in different proportions. The first column, it's, it's quite difficult to see the first column, it is in a proportion in which histamine 
is four times the one of other diamines. In, in the second case, the concentrations are uh, um, lower. In this particular case, four times the presence of histamine. And what do we see then? We see that when histamine is in the presence of putrescine or cadaverine, the degradation speed goes down significantly, regardless of the concentration. In all cases, this was significantly smaller than when, the, uh, when it was on its own. This speed is very low when other diamines had uh, concentrations that were much higher. Four times to 20 times the history. It was always significant, but when it was in higher concentrations, the decrease of the speed was quite marked. The speed that I'm speaking about right now, here we can see that in these figures, when we represent the uh, cinetic of the degradation, when histamine is on its own, and in gray, you can actually see this. In the rest of colors, it's together with putrescine, calabrine, up to four times the histamine classical development. And for all, uh, for all the different timings, the delay in this degradation is obvious. It's a much slower one. So when it is degraded, it is, much, it is done much more slowly. When other diamines is, are in different proportions, here is 20 times that. And after three hours, there still uh, has to go more than 40% uh, of, the, of the compound. In 90 minutes, it is fully degraded. So these results may well explain why there are foods that even though they don't have histamine, if they have high content of putrescine or cadaverine, they can be associated with symptoms. And therefore, they can be present in the exclusion list for food in diets. This scenario is therefore one that uh, provides several frameworks. It could be cadaverine and others that could be incorporated to the, to the group. And these uh, diamines are 20 to four times on top of that is a, a, a feasible scenario. And finally, this critical review of all the foods, the list that we have found in all these diets, we can see that um, they don't include a histamine or any amine that includes this. This is the case, for instance, of chocolate, seafood, uh, eggs, pineapple, cherries, etc. Some of these foods that are in these diets but which do not have any amine that justifies high content that may bring about this effect. We have uh, described this as endogenous histamine li uh, liberators. We don't know how this liberation of endogenous elements is produced, but in, the, in this study by Mainz, which was one of the first ones to provide the list, so normally all the rest of the studies are kind of dragging with them this first study. The evidence, therefore, is not very clear on where do we get those. So as you see, this adds more complexity to the equation, especially for these diets. And as a summary, I'd like to say that the high variability of the contents, the lack of consensus in the recommendation of 
uh, foods that have to be excluded, the presence of other amines that could be responsible for symptomatology. All these factors are ones that will uh, make it more difficult for the follow-up of the um, histamine diet. It would be essential that, on the one hand, the food industry keeps on implementing control strategies that reduce the uh, formation of histamine. And on the other hand, that there could it could be said in the label that there is a presence or a lack of the labeling of histamine. So I want to thank you for your attention to finish with my presentation. And this is the research group I belong to. As you can see in this picture, we are fully devoted to the study of histamine intolerance and DEO syndrome amongst other research press uh, related to the presence of histamine and food. Thank you.